Tsui Shu, on the double ninth, climbing the Immortal's Lookout Terrace, presented to District Magistrate Liu Rong. The Han Emperor Wen built a tall terrace. Today we climb it to look down on dawn's glory. To the north lie the three Jin, among clouded peaks. To the east lie the two tombs, sending wind and rain. Who now remembers Jin, the guardian at the gate? Or the old immortal of the river who vanished through it? Enough. I will go and look for Tao Yuanming. Together we'll get drunk on chrysanthemum sprinkled wine. So, uh, this is the only poem in the collection to be uh, included by Tsui Shu. We don't know much about this person. Um, practically the only thing we know is that he was a, famously from a poor family and a very diligent student. He passed the Jinshi examinations in 738 and uh, the poem that he had written for the examinations was, um, you know, gave him a very high reputation. Yeah. It was, I think, a poem about the Ming Tang, which was a ritual structure that appeared in the classics and that the Tang emperors had tried to build and to, to regulate what, uh, what, what, what ritual uses uh, and should be done with that space. But anyway, the poem we have here is not his examination poem. As we said, he passed the examinations in 738 and we practically know nothing else of him. He had a very minor posts like District Defender at Hene. So high time poet. And what else can we say? Okay, so uh, the title on the double ninth. So I, I think we've already mentioned, I'm not completely sure that uh, the double ninth festival was one of the great festivals, was one of the great celebrations in ancient China where many of the uh, seasonal celebrations included, it would take took place at doubles of the day and, and the month. So first day, first month, third day, third month. Uh, fifth day, fifth month, seventh day, seventh uh, month, and of course, nine day, nine month. The ninth of the ninth is um, the, a festival that takes place at the end of the autumn, at the beginning of the winter. It's in the last month of autumn. It's generally called the Chrysanthemum Festival because it's the time when uh, chrysanthemums flower. And uh, to avoid uh, evil omens and bad luck, it's traditional on the double ninth, uh, since as many uh, ages and many centuries back, for Chinese scholars to climb mountains on that day and to drink chrysanthemum wine, which is believed to prolong one's life. So here we have a poem about precisely this sort of an outing. Tsui Shu is climbing, not a mountain, he calls it the Immortal's Lookout Terrace. He's probably climbing it with uh, this um, friend, District Magistrate Liu Rong. And... Uh, of course, for a poem that is centered on such a date, it includes overtones of um, long life, of the passage of time, of immortality. The, 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 those are especially clear in the last couplet, as we'll see, with a reference to Chrysanthemum Wine and to Tao Yuanming, who, who made, uh, if not others, he at least was one of the most famous writers on the topic of the Double Ninth Festival. And he, he had at least one very famous poem about the Double Ninth Festival, about drinking chrysanthemum wine. Okay, so apart from the date, it's important. The title also mentions a place which is climbed. Now, there were many mountains in the area surrounding the capital, but what was climbed by Tsushu was a terrace, the Immortals Lookout Terrace. Now, I've been searching for information about this, uh, this building, this... Uh, sorry, not this... Well, it's a human construction. A terrace would have been an elevated, relatively flat space. And, uh, you know, a lot of them were built by emperors with, with even more buildings on top. Uh, this one it would have been called in Chinese Yo Gao Tai, uh, which is, yeah, the, the, uh, the elevated, the high, the, the high immortals lookout. Now, this was built, and the poem tells us about this, by, or was ordered to be built by Emperor Wen of the Han Dynasty. Emperor Wen of the Han Dynasty 
lived in the early years of the second century before Christ. So this would have been, I don't know, almost a millennium before this poem by Sui Shu was written, almost a thousand years previously in time. Han uh, Wendy, this emperor, was, the, was quite a successful emperor, a consolidator of Han Wu. He was quite, uh, quite austere, he didn't spend much. In, in fact, there's a famous anecdote about him refusing to build a terrace because it proved to be uh, more expensive than was anticipated. Nevertheless, he did still find the fans, it seems, to build this immortal's lookout terrace, probably close to the capital, Chang'an. This poem must be located in some area relatively close to the imperial capital of the Han and of the Tang dynasties. Emperor Wen is also interesting because during his time, Confucianism was still not yet the official orthodoxy or of the imperial creed. In fact, during the first years of the Han dynasty, a, a, Taoist, a variety of Taoism called Huang Lao uh, was the one that was all the rage, all the vogue, and the courtiers and relatives and Emperor Wu and Emperor Wen himself favoured Taoism of this variety. And that's significant because a lot of the images, a lot of the references that are made in this poem, which is quite hermetic, by the way, are references to a Taoist religion. Okay, so we've got, therefore, a poem that celebrates a typical cultural social event in which scholar officials um, um, occupy themselves, like you know, in, in the double ninth celebration, climbing a mountain. Uh, not, not a mountain, as I said, it's a terrace, but it's similar to climbing a mountain. So we will get a landscape poem um, as, a, as, a, as a theme, because it will describe what can be seen from the top of the terrace. We also get a Taoistically inclined poem, because the images, the references, the general tone of the poem seems to focus on, on Taoist images of uh, the desire for immortality and uh, um, exam examples of, 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 of patrons and of divinities of Taoism from the past. And, you know, this matches well the, the overall theme of the festivity, the Double Ninth Festival, as we said, because it's a festival that, uh, you know, puts the emphasis on prolonging life, on immortality. So let's take a look at the poem as we usually do, couplet by couplet. As I said, this poem is pretty hermetic. There are lots of place names and, uh, and references that, uh, you know, are not transparent at all. And uh, this poem would have really profited from, uh, from some heavy annotation, which it does not have. So, uh, first couplet. The Han Emperor Wen built a tall terrace. Today, we climb it to look down on Dawn's glory. So as usual, the first couplet is generally the most straightforward, the one that, in a summary, in a nutshell, here in 14 characters, tells us what is happening in this poem, what is the background, in what way are we meant to read it. So the poem starts mentioning Emperor Han Wendy, in the, in the poem it's Han Wendy, Wendy Huang, yeah. So Han Wendy Huang, the, the complete imperial title, and then the name of the terrace, yeah, in more, uh, that is a literal translation of the first line, would be uh, Han Wen Huang Di, uh, and, and now the name, the Chinese name for the, for the tower, for, sorry, for the terrace. So, uh, which would be Yo Gao Tai. So, Han Wen Huang Di Yo Gao Tai. So, the Emperor Wen, the cultured emperor of the Han Dynasty, and uh, the immortal lookout terrace, with the implication being the Emperor made this tower or had, the, not this tower, sorry, this terrace, had this uh, terrace uh, constructed, had this terrace built. And now we're climbing up and we're looking down. It's early morning, it's dawn, so we can enjoy all the landscape of, of, that can be appreciated from high on this terrace. All the landmarks of the land within the passes of the imperial capital region. And it's dawn, everything is you know, visible and light and there's a relatively happy light atmosphere. Okay, so uh, second couplet, which as usual is the first of the parallelistic couplets. 
To the north lie the three gyms among clouded peaks. To the east lie the two tombs, sending wind and rain. So in this couplet, I think it's, it's very easy to see the parallelism. It's pretty transparent. Yeah. So uh, three maps with two, Jin maps with tomb, um, mountains and uh, clouds probably match with wind and rain. So you no, know, um, and uh, so the parallelism is quite quite evident. So the second couplet shows us what can be seen from the top of the immortals' lookout terrace. Uh, it's Rishu and his friend look out. They look to the north and they see the three jinn. What's the three jinn? Well, mm, one of the feudal states and uh, mm, of, of of the springs and autumns period was the state of Jin, which occupied most of north central China. Today, the area to the north of, 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 the, of the Yellow River, after it makes its big bend into Mongolia, and the area of the present-day provinces of, I think, mainly Shanxi and maybe a bit of Shanxi. So this was one of the most important of states in the, in the springs and autumns. But during the warring states, it broke up into three minor states, the states of Zhao, of Han, and Wei. So the three Jin is, you know, a way of referring to... Um, the whole territory of the ancient state of Jin. So looking to the north, one sees cloudy mountains and the area of what would have been the old state of Jin. Looking to the east, one sees the two tombs sending wind and rain. So the twin tombs, the twin mounds, you know, they're probably um, a reference to some of the Han Dynasty tombs. So uh, is the Erling, the two mounds. So the, 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 especially the emperors of the Western Han Dynasty, but I think all of the Han emperors tended to be buried in, in um, artificial or, or semi-artificial um, mountains or mounds on top of those mountains. And generally um, whole villages and groups of people were uprooted and sent to live on those uh, mountains, uh, you know, to, to have people for the funerary rites and uh, that, that were be given to the to the Han emperors. So probably there is a reference here to at least two of the tombs, perhaps to the tomb of, 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 of Han Wendy himself. So it's interesting, the second couplet is showing us what can be seen from the top of this terrace. It's significant that the things that can be seen, mountains in the old state of Jin, tombs uh, amidst wind and rain to the east, they're all references to, well, the past and to, to things that have disappeared and that are no longer among us. The three jinn do not exist anymore. The emperors who were all powerful emperors of the Han Dynasty are just tombs now, uh, just mounds to the east. And uh, again, if, if one of the tombs is that of Emperor Wen, this connects very well with the builder of the terrace from whence uh, Tsui Shu and his friend are gazing out. Okay, next uh, couplet, the third couplet, which is also a parallelistic couplet. Who now remembers Jin, the guardian at the gate, or the old immortal of the river who vanished through it? So the third couplet is quite hermetic as well, and if in the second couplet we have a description of landmarks that could be seen from the terrace, landmarks that can be connected, uh, at least uh, partially, to Taoist overtones or ideas of of Emperor um, Han Wendy and of immortality, the, the third couplet very clearly connects us with Taoist imagery, with Taoist uh, divinities. And it also plays along with this Ubi Sun theme of where have they gone? Uh, what has happened with the emperors of the past? And now what has happened with those sage Taoist immortals or sages who lived in the past? And who, you know, the implied answer is they are no longer in the world, but they have transcended and now we live perhaps in a darker age where it is more difficult to get um, transcendence and, uh, and sound advice and teaching of the way. Who now remembers Jin, the guardian at the gate, or the old immortal of the river who vanished through it? So the references are pretty hermetic. The first one, uh, Jin, the guardian of the gate, Jin, the guardian of the past, refers to Jin Shi, I think, who was, uh, you know, he, he had that post of guardian of the past to the west when Lao Tzu 
the founder of Taoism, went allegedly into the West never to, re to, to return. And so he became the recipient of his teachings because before Lao Tzu left China, uh, Jin Shi would have asked uh, uh, the sage to, to give him some scriptures. And uh, you know this makes sense because Emperor Wen and the later tradition would collect um, and uh, patronize the Taoist scriptures, including those texts allegedly written by um, Lao Tzu, like, for, like uh, well, basically one, the Tao Te Ching. So he says, who remembers Jin, this guardian of the gates, the founder of Taoism, really? Or the old immortal of the river who vanished through it? Uh, this second reference was much more difficult for me to find. In fact, there seem to be conflicting interpretations about what this old and model of the river who vanished uh, might refer to. But after doing some checking, uh, I think this is uh, He Shang Gong, uh, this, the riverside elder, and uh, it seems to refer to uh, a legend of, 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 of a Dao, of a Taoist sage uh, who was visited by Emperor Han Wendy. Uh, who was a student of the Tao Te Ching and of Taoism, as we said, and you know they had a conversation, and uh, and uh, you know the, 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 this this riverside elder would have given some Taoist wisdom of detachment from the world, which angered the emperor. But then you know he he started to float, and uh, and showed the emperor that he wasn't from this world; that he was a semi-divine. Uh, figure and probably he later on disappeared and joined the immortals. Now this tradition about uh, He Shang Gong was um, probably systematized by Ge Xuan, a Taoist of the third century AD. By the time this would have been recognized as you know relatively canonical for the Taoists as well. So this couplet, as I said, it synthesizes two figures, two important figures from Taoism in its Subi Sun idea of where have these old teachers of Taoism gone to? Probably with the double implication of they have become immortal, and now it's more difficult. And now it's more difficult because we don't have teachers like these around to teach us. And it connects well with the Immortals Lookout Terrace because uh, the second one, this uh, old immortal of the river, would have been the one who spoke with, uh, with uh, Han Wendy. Uh, Jin, the guardian of the gate, would have been the producer of the first hour's text, which Emperor Wen would have studied. And it all connects again with the seasonal festivity topic of long life and immortality of the Double Ninth Festival. Okay, finally, the last uh, couplet. Enough, I will go and look for Tao Yuan Ming. Together we'll get drunk from chrysanthemum sprinkled wine. So Tao Yuan Ming, Tao Qian, is the revered poet of the 4th century, of whom we've talked a lot about. He's the founder of the... Of the there were antecedents, but at least he became the greatest figure uh, in the, the retired scholar type of poetry. That is praising the quiet life of the scholar official, enjoying the simple pleasures of reading, agriculture, meeting and drinking with neighbours and friends. Uh, as usual in Chinese poetry, the reference to Tao Zhuang Ming is much more ambivalent, is much more uh, oblique. In, uh, in the original poem. In fact, he is referred to as Peng Zhe Zai. That is, uh, the, um, the, the official, the, the magistrate of Peng Zhe, because uh, during his uh, lifetime, he was very briefly appointed to that posting, magistrate of uh, Peng Zhe. So Zui Shu ends the poem imagining that he will join Tao Zhuangming or some other imitators or people like Tao Zhuangming, to drink chrysanthemum wine, just as Tao Zhuangming described drinking chrysanthemum wine in the Double Ninth Festival. So, okay, not a bad poem in general. Um, too hermetic for my taste. So this is an example of the sort of, um, of poetry that is generally not included in this anthology, that is more complex for a reader, definitely for a Western reader, but also for the, for the um, uh, young audience for which this anthology is designed. Because, you know, understanding this type of poem requires being acquainted with a lot of references to previous figures. And, uh, you know, this was obligatory for the scholar officials in the examinations. For the examinations, they had to memorize vast corpuses of poetry and, uh, and the classics. So, so this would have been uh, very easy to spot references for a scholar official, but not so easily 
is seen by others. And, uh, and you know, they're, they're quite um, habitual in most Chinese poetry, not in most of the Chinese poetry in this anthology, which plays down um, uh, these references, but they still make it, as in, as in this example, as in this poem that we have just heard and commented.